Festivals were reflecting and questioning Thatcher's New Britain. Unemployment had reached record levels and anxiety reigned. People were just leaving the cities in droves, young people with no hope of a job or anything. You know, three guys would chuck 100 quid in and buy an old coach from the back of a coach company, you know, one of their old ones, they retired, throw a few mattresses in and, and, and head off. And so what happened was that movement grew and grew and grew. And suddenly, instead of just the kind of sort of, you know, slightly better off hippies making their kind of arts fair up in Norfolk, like the Albion fairs and so forth, you drive a whole load of sort of quite hardcore working class people from up north onto the road. In 1979, I think there were six vehicles at Stonehenge, you know, and by 1984, there were thousands of people hitting the road. More and more people appeared on the festival scenes drinking, you know, the whole punk sort of attitude, you know, fuck everything kind of thing, you know, was uh, quite prevalent amongst a growing group of younger disenfranchised people who had just given up on living in cities. We're just trying we're just to live our lives. Yeah, so. we don't need to fear of anyone yeah. else. Yeah. And this world's supposed to be a common treasury for everybody to share, not yeah. people to Free button land. up. You know what I mean? No wonder people are starting to get sick. These people are pushing our people too close. And, like, it's going to start to explode one of these days. This, this whole thing here is just a total farce. Cities are going crazy, everybody's going crazy. It's all because of this. They're trying to, trying to impose a police state. A lot of people won't get no supper tonight. A lot of people won't get no justice tonight. I used to live in a live in a spot, you know, and I always thought, you know, it'd be great if I could get, you know, save up enough to get hold of a, something that I could own myself and drive about in it and call it my home. own home. Call it home. There was a definite kind of tribalism going on, and you know, the whole new age, new age travellers and new age gypsies and the convoy and all those. You know, there were lots of different little cults of people. You know. A lot of them were sort of social casualties, really. A lot of them were drug casualties. A lot of them were... Well, they were living outside the law, really. They weren't um, completely independent of the system. A lot of them were on the dole. So I think that the sort of... Um, the authorities saw these, this uh, movement as rather a threat. <laughs> Original hippie idealists were being joined on the road by a new generation of post-punk urban squatters. This collective would become known as the Peace Convoy, and as they arrived at Stonehenge Festival in 1984, it seemed peace and love had now fully surrendered to anger and resentment. See these teeth? Put them in now. Go on. Kick them in now, man. They were in excess of 100,000 people at Stonehenge. You know, as with any town that size, you're, you're bound to have a few um, mischievous elements, shall we say. Bikers started just mercilessly beating up any punks that they could get their hands on. It was like being in some sort of medieval nightmare. It was as though the whole thing had hardened up, but the political thing had hardened as well. And it was a reflection of that. Welcome home, you total stranger. scary stuff it was just wild people just arrived and did what they wanted to do they set up stages they you know sold drugs they did whatever they wanted to do and it was quite scary you know the one man it did look like apocalypse now because there were helicopters flying around with lights and you know it, it was pretty ugly In 84, you know, on the way off the site, we saw a whole bunch of 
people trashing the police command um, unit, if you like. Uh, and at that point, I thought, you've just finished it. The increasingly lawless peace convoy stood for everything the establishment despised. And in 1985, the tension would reach boiling point. At one point, we were on our way to a festival up in uh, Cumbria. I think it was called Blue Moon or something. And the police were on their way to the miners' strike. And this huge flotilla of police went back, and they all had banners in the back saying, you're next. And it was pretty bloody obvious that, you know, what was going to happen in Stonehenge 85, the bean field. You could see it coming like a train. The local chief constable had borrowed police from all over the country. Wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not here to bargain with you. I'm here to say something, something to you for you to consider. Now, you don't have to make an answer you now. Go. You can get you through to, to me. Now we want to go to Stonehenge. Well, the Stonehenge Festival, as you know, has been cancelled this year. I'm hoping that we'll get through the day without too many people being injured. Before the actual uh, uh, confrontation happened, just literally minutes before, and as it was happening, there was instructions coming from senior police officers to break skulls. We just want to get off this field as peacefully and quietly as we can. And this lot, all these coppers are just here for one reason, and that's to cause trouble. I mean, I don't want to cause trouble. I ain't going to cause trouble. I ain't got a stick or anything. They weren't just riot police. There were special forces. There were, oh, you know, there were soldiers. They had large truncheons and they had their heavy shields and they were banging and moving slowly forward. And it was surreal. And we were standing there filming this as this was happening. And I was thinking to myself, I'm in another, another uh, world. I didn't do anything, mate. They smashed me windows. They hit me on the head with truncheons. They hit me when I was on the floor. On the deck. On the deck. No. On the deck. Are you still there, boy? They then started using their truncheons to smash windows. Hundreds of police officers. Batons waving, smashing the window as this thing was still moving. They brought it to a halt by standing in front. There were a lot of people in it. It was, it was their home. And they absolutely trashed it. They just went in, they smashed the window, smashed the door down, got inside, and you could, all you could hear was screaming. <laughs> what we, the ITN camera crew, and myself as a reporter have seen in the last 30 minutes here on this field has been some of the most brutal police treatment of people I've witnessed in my entire career as a journalist. We're genuine people just like yourselves, and we need help right now. Yeah. Please, help us, all of you. Help us, stand by us. The convoy, in a way, had turned into its own worst enemy. It had turned into a bit of a Babylon on wheels, really. There was still a lot of good people in it, and there was a lot of good hope, but there was an ugly side to it and a greedy side to it. So in a way, I don't know what would happen if it hadn't been attacked, but it, I think it needed to change anyway. But it was a brutal way to change. You know. I travel to a mystical time zone And I miss my bed And I soon came home Rush and the push and the land That we stand on is our... With the Battle of the Beanfield, the establishment had crushed free festival culture. The original dream of an alternative, utopian society now lay in tatters. What was left of the convoy made their way to a place where they knew they could find some sanctuary. A lot of people were really scared to deal with them. So Michael ended up kind of driving, you know, he got the call that they're leaving Stonehenge at two in the morning and, you know, he was up all night waiting for them. This is a really, you know, quite a small village in, in the middle of the West Country. And so when all these trucks were arriving, you know, it was people were really scared. I was dealing with, with, with these people on my own, really, because uh, I was just an ordinary sort of Somerset farmer lab, really. And I'd never seen anything like it before. 
and 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 I mean they were wild. They were angry as well. They were really really tough times, and, and people were really embittered after it. People started living on sites, you know, with, with the wreckage of what they had left over. But it was really the record to their dream, you know, was, was what was being destroyed, you know. But you say we're bad news. news. Were you the good yeah. news? We were the good so reports you got. You're unreliable. All the... You know, all the work I've been doing for you, all the way through, yeah. you invited yourselves here. I gave you 19 or however many tickets to come on. I said that we'd look after we you well. We gave you the best show you've had here for years. So we'd look after you well. We gave you the only uh, show that isn't just. That's all right. I don't know what you expected. I mean, you well, expected said. to not to be out of pocket. Yeah. 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 I've been on oh, this show for 17 it. years, and I've been fair and reasonable all that time. Yeah. Well, if I hadn't have been, I wouldn't be here now, it would I'd be cut to pieces by now. By the end of the 80s, with Glastonbury struggling with the times and Reading facing bankruptcy, the outlook for British festivals was bleak. <laughs>